All right, Acts chapter 8. Let's do this. Let's read the text, and I, I'll tell you this. I don't know if this is encouraging or discouraging. I've got a lot of stuff um, for tonight. That's probably the discouraging part. Uh, but here's what's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop when it's time to stop. I'm going to give us some time for questions. And then we can always just pick it up next week, wherever we stop. All right. Uh, so, but that means you've got to come next week. Uh, so here we are. So, uh, Acts chapter 8. Starting verse 1, let's read. We already covered about uh, eight of these verses, uh, but let's read from 1 to 25. We'll get the context, and then we'll, we'll dive right in. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, that being Stephen, remember that. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house to house, uh, house after house, excuse me, and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip, and as they heard and saw and signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Verse 9. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, That man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that none of what you have said may come upon me. Verse 25, So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. <coughs> Excuse me. Now that's an interesting story, isn't it? We don't get to deal with magic a lot. Now when I think of the subject of magic, obviously my generation was really big into the Harry Potter stuff, but I don't think of Harry Potter when I think of magic. I think of a native of Brooklyn from the early part of the 20th century. Harry Houdini, right? I'm sure you've heard of him. He was the consummate magician. He's a fascinating guy. You know I love history, right? He, he could be buried underground for what seemed like hours and hours. People would think he had suffocated and then pff, voila, he's there, right? He made people think he walked through brick walls. He would make elephants disappear. He was really the consummate showman and magician in his day. He seemed to have control over physical things like shackles or straight jackets and no one could figure out how Harry Houdini with his magic could overcome those elements. In fact, he was regarded as someone who had some kind of contact with the supernatural, with forces that are beyond us. So much so that a medical doctor by the name of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who's famous for writing 
Sherlock Holmes, is that right? The anthology series. So that this guy, someone who wrote the character of the logical Sherlock Holmes, this guy believed that Harry Houdini had influence even over the spirit world. Houdini and Doyle were friends, and Houdini actually lost his friendship with Sir Arthur Conan, Conan Doyle by proving just the opposite. <clears throat> He wrote a book called The Magician Among Spirits and showed that those so-called spiritualists that claimed to be those who in seance or spoke with people that had died and so on, that it was all a farce. The point was, the people that believed a magician had control over natural things by his abracadabra or his tricks. And that's really what magic is. <laughs> It's supposedly possessing control from a superior knowledge of certain elements of the natural world such that a person seems to possess godlike power. Today, in what has been called the inner spiritual age, there's a growing interest in channeling shamans or voodoo or sorcery and magic that professes to do exactly that. One of the great things I love about scriptures to show you how relevant the Bible is today is that you have this clash in the Old Testament and New Testament between the true and living God and magicians. Can anyone give me an example of God doing battle with magicians? Maybe from the Old Testament? Moses, right? <clears throat> That's the one we all think of. You got it. In Egypt with Moses, the magicians could counterfeit some things, right? I love, by the way, Prince of Egypt. They're voiced by Steve Martin and Martin Short. Comedy legends, all right? Uh, they did all the miracles like changing the rod into a snake. I don't know how they, they changed water into blood, but they did that. And, but when it actually came to creating life, they couldn't do that. They could perpetuate frogs or tadpoles, but they couldn't create life. They're too small for that. Only the true and living God could. So he bested magicians against Egypt, a foreign land where magicians seemed to have contact with the gods. The Lord showed himself triumphant. Then later in Babylon, there was another instance in the same thing with Daniel who represented the true and living gods, a type of Christ. And the best Nebuchadnezzar could do would get his astrologers in there, all those magicians to interpret this dream. But who interpreted it right? Daniel. He bested the magicians. Now, Jesus, did Jesus ever encounter a magician? Actually, no, because Jesus' primary ministry was in Jerusalem. And did you know, Jerusalem wasn't a foreign land. Magicians were illegal in Jerusalem because they were, get this, con artists. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jesus continually showed his power over creation. Now the gospel is going beyond Jerusalem. Remember we're at the second stage here. Jerusalem, now we're in Judea and Samaria. We're going beyond that and guess what's there? Magicians again. That brings up the text before us in Acts 8. So remember this, the disciples, they're scattered, right? So they, uh, Philip particularly, Philip the deacon goes about 40 miles up north of Jerusalem. He's out in the suburbs supposedly of Jerusalem and he's in this area of national, national, national and religious half-breeds known as the Samaritans. He proclaims Christ to them. The people heeded the things spoken by Philip, which means they heard it. They listened, they saw the miracles he did, tremendous powers like the powers of magicians, but the powers of the resurrected Christ are at work. Remember, unclean spirits are crying out with a loud voice. They come out of many who were possessed, many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. There's great rejoicing in the city. And then we come to this rather idiosyncratic, right? This really out of nowhere, that's my word of the day, by the way, uh, portion of the book of Acts about a magician. This is just a story that's just distinct. <laughs> it's individual. This is about the spirit coming, distinct from the time of the people believing in Samaria. <clears throat> and what I think at the end is probably the sternest speech in the whole book of Acts, to be very blunt. In fact, Philip says to Simon, or Peter says to Simon, excuse me, your money go to destruction or go to hell with you. You don't really have preaching like that elsewhere in Acts. So our message today is Simon, Samaria, and the Spirit. In verses 9 through 13 in our outline, we've got an encounter of what we're just calling the greats. 
Uh, it's not Simon and Philip, by the way. Those aren't the two greats. It's Simon and Christ. Simon's only the great because he proclaims to be, by the way. That's a spoiler alert. We're calling it a counter of the greats in verses 9 through 13. And there's an interlude which you can scratch your head about, but the interlude is when the Spirit comes to Samaria in verses 14 through 17. Then the remainder of the portion of the word we're reading from the day in verses 18 through 24, which we may or may not get to, there's a warning. A sobering word against false professions of faith. Like I said, it's a rich text. There's a lot here. So let's get started. First, an encounter of the greats in verses 9 through 13. There in Samaria, what do we know about the Samaritans? Anything we remember about the Samaritans from last week? They're, they're pictured by Christ in the parable of, the, of being the, the, the good Samaritan, right? Which would have been just crazy to the, the Jews at that time. And why would it have been crazy for the Jews? Where did they come from? How did the Samaritans get there? They're half-breeds, right? So the time of the dispersion, right? The split kingdoms of Israel. You had somebody that had to fill the land. And so what filled the land were other nations and mixed in with, with Jerusalem, with Jews. And so they're half Jews, half pagan. And what do they believe? What books of the Bible do they believe? Verse 5. Where was their temple? Mount Gerizim. Remember that? The woman at the well says that. Which temple do you worship? So they're, they're half-breeds. They're different. Here, they were in Samaria. They're north of Jerusalem. People are giving heed to Philip as he speaks. Miraculous works are being done because remember... The apostles had laid hands on Philip. Remember that? Miraculous works are done. Why? What's that? The Holy Spirit comes, right? And, and every time there's a miraculous work, it's because what's just happened or what's about to happen? The gospel, right? To authenticate the gospel. They don't happen willy-nilly. They're done by the apostles or them whom they laid hands on as a way of testifying that the work God was coming to a people. So you got signs and wonders confirmed that the word of God is coming by immediate inspiration. And so here's meeting of Philip. There's great rejoicing in the city. But parallel to all of this, in Luke's way of writing, is a certain man named Simon. Verse 9. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. So prior to Philip, there's a man on the block who was a magician. He had tricks. <laughs> he performed those tricks that astonished and amazed the people. And in those tricks, he professed to have certain control over a certain created order. And he was regarded as being a great sorcerer. Didn't say what he did, but it was enough for the people to be astonished. Notice that language in the text. Astonishing the people. He did his sorcery, his tricks, whatever it is, his Harry Houdini act. And the, the people were astonished in Samaria, even as he claims he's someone great. That's pivotal, by the way. Keep that in mind as we go to verse 10. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. They gave attention to him. Notice that phrase as well. From the least to the greatest, which probably means from the youngest to the oldest, the poorest to the richest, whatever. All the categories gave heed to him, gave attention to him, and that's important. Because look at verse 6. When Philip comes, what does the crowd do? The crowds with one accord were what? Giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard, that's first by the way, and saw the signs which he was performing. That's intriguing. When Philip comes, the crowds now give attention to him and what he says and does. Previously, the people had given attention to Simon, who was said he was someone great, who did these things even as it was said of him. This man is called the great power of God. There's two ways commentators often treat that uh, origin of this statement. It says it either means one or two things when you think about him being the great power of God. A, is that Simon believed he was some kind of emanation of deity. He was some kind of extension or medium of a deity, a branch of deity. So that's when he did his amazing trick. It was as if God had come to the world through this emanation of deity and did that work. The other explanation is that it could have meant many thought 
he was actually God himself. That he actually is speaking to the people as God himself. Now look, I thought about that. And as I thought about that, I thought in my mind, that there's no way that's true, right? There's no way that that could possibly happen. That people could be that gullible to think that this magician was God. And then I did some research. And in my study, I came across an event in 1973 called Millennium 73. Does anybody remember Millennium 73? Let me explain to you what it was. Uh, get this. Millennium 73, that was prior to Desert Storm, prior to the war in Iraq. Millennium 73 was going to usher in a period of universal peace, goodness, and love, and benevolence on the earth by God himself who would come from the clouds and proclaim that to his people. And the way that he would come was by a little pot guru by the name of Guru Maharaji of the Divine Light Mission. Ever heard of the Divine Light Mission? Well, indeed, he did come from England in his own private jet to Millennium 73 in Houston, Texas. This one who said poverty was the way of greatest blessedness came from the clouds in his own private jet declaring to people that through him all of the promises of the Messiah were going to be realized. And they said the promotion of that event reached all the college campuses across America. They handed out flyers with this dude's smiling face on it with big letters that says it is divine. He was claiming deity. Now it influenced millions of people and at that time a profound following of that Simon the magician of his own day was formed. Supposedly, if you followed him, you had knowledge. And they, just, just Google Millennium 73 this week. Really weird things that they taught. It's fascinating ring. And it reminded me of that great quote by the a wonderful theologian P.T. Barnum, right? There's a sucker born every minute. Um, so you read this. You read this in Acts 8, don't say, oh, those poor first century souls. They were just confused. They didn't know real magic, right? They, they just were confused. They're, they're ignorant. Instead, think of Guru Maharaji and the famous quotation by writer G.K. Chesterton that says, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And that's what happens here. These people are following Simon, and he's supposedly the great one, this emanation or deity. But now the people are giving their attention to Philip. Philip's performing miracles, so they give the attention not to Simon. But look at verses 11 and 12. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. They gave attention to Philip in verse 6. They believed the things of the kingdom of God concerning Jesus Christ. Now they realize not only that God has a kingdom spoken of in the Old Testament, the five books of Moses that they believed, but there was a Messiah. And notice it speaks of Christ, the kingdom of God, in Jesus Christ, Savior, Messiah. And then they're baptized into his name, both men and women. So Philip comes and he speaks of these things regarding a real kingdom and he performs a miracle. And remember, those miracles, they're just not signs. They're previews of coming attractions. We talked about that. He says, this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like. It's going to be like in its fullest evil. It's going to be cast out, paralyzed, is going to be made well. The lame will be made well, ultimately in the new heavens and new earth. Here are these little sparks of these things done in history. But ultimately, the encounter of these greats was not Simon and Philip, but Simon with Jesus. Because acts are the things that Jesus continues to do and teach. So there's a clear encounter of the two, and notice who wins. The followers go over to Philip, and ultimately to Christ. They're baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women. Here the baptism, as it always does, indicates, as often, a change of ownership. They're publicly portraying that they are no longer owned by their own deity of the Samaritans. They're owned by Christ. They're baptized, showing that they are owned by God. 
So clearly, you see in the encounter of the greats in verses 9 through 13 that Christ obtains the victory. Read verse 13. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly, what's that? Amazed. Simon professed faith in Christ. Philip representing Christ as a follower of Christ. Simon continued to follow Philip, learned from Philip, and he was constantly amazed. The language of amazement has been used here again. Remember verse 9, that same word. He was astonishing the people with his supposed miracles. Now he himself having astonished the people. Verse 13. He himself is astonished or amazed seeing the great miracles that have taken place. So you get the picture, okay? Say with me. He's baptized. He believes. He follows Philip. But the big things here for him are those miracles. How do they do this? Man, how do they get this done? That's what he's thinking at this point. Now, the point thus far is this. Christ's church, again, in the book of Acts, is alive and at work. Christ will always best the magicians. <laughs> Throughout the earth, the power of Christ and his kingdom, the power to change lives, always bested the supposed magicians. There's a story, a quaint one, written by one of the church historians named Hippolytus. Hippolytus and the other church fathers said uh, these things. Whether they're true or not, we're not sure. This isn't Bible. This is church history. Uh, so we don't know if they're ultimately true. But there are some fascinating stories about what ends up happening to Simon. He supposedly became a leader in Gnosticism, a way in getting super ordinary knowledge by which you inform people. And supposedly, he ended up being a tremendous heretic, not to spoil the story. But Hippolytus reads this story about Simon. He says this. He says, when he was on the point of being shown up, this being Simon, he said in order to gain time, that if he were buried alive, he would rise again on the third day. So he bade that a tomb should be dug by his disciples, which, by the way, he has disciples, that should shock you, and that he should be buried in it. Now they did when they were ordered, what they were ordered, but he remained there until now, for he was not the Christ. Amen. Now, whether or not that's true, we don't know. It's recorded by a man who, who says a lot of really true things, by the way, but regardless... It goes to show that he thought I could do these types of things as well. He was buried, but he could not best the Christ. Jesus always best the magicians. See, here's what people do. Here's what we do even in our culture. People will try to get some power by which if they can't try to be God themselves, they will ultimately try and get somebody else who will be a God to them, like Guru Maharaji. <laughs> It could be somebody who does a horoscope for you or speaks to dead people on your behalf. It's, it's our way of trying to get in some contact on what is beyond the earth. But friends, if, if you have the true and living God, you don't need magicians. <laughs> so here's Simon, and he at least at this point believes, and it proves to be a victory of Christ. And you'll see it's a victory indeed. Any questions about point number one as I take a sip of water? Any thoughts or questions so far about that? Oh yeah. It's, it's, and even the group in 2012 that begins selling all their houses and, and stuff before 2012 so that they, they knew the end of the world was coming, right? It's just, you do some research. It, I, I hate to say that it was comical this week um, because it, it, ultimately it's sad. Uh, because these people are lost and yet the things that people will hold on to or try and believe because they're searching for a God that fits them and setting, instead of giving themselves over to the actual God of the universe, it's heartbreaking, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Who's that? Applegate? Applegate. It seems like they pop up at least once a decade. Yeah, Justin? Mm. 
hell? We'll see. Something tells me that might be a Simon the Magician all over again, right? See if he rises. Um, I got a spoiler alert. He won't. Uh, there you go. Uh, okay, let's move on to the interlude here. It's just, it is shocking what people believe. But I think this is where it's just interesting because this story kind of takes a shift away. And then it actually comes back to Simon. And so if we don't get back to Simon uh, this week, that's okay. We'll, we'll get to him again next week. We'll finish it up. But here we have the interlude here um, in verses 14 through 17. The Spirit through Samaria. So what I want to do, I want to read the text and break this down and try to figure out what he's saying here. And uh, remember, the apostles, where are they? Where are the apostles? Not scattered. Not the apostles. In Jerusalem, remember, it was mostly who that was scattered. Remember? The, the type of Jews that came in, what were they called? Hellenistic Jews. Yeah, most of those are who we believe are scattered. Let me say that. Because it's indicated through the deacons being scattered. The apostles are still in Jerusalem, okay? So this is what happens is they're still there. They aren't scattered. They're about 40 miles south. And then verse 14 happens. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God... They sent them Peter and John. That phrase, receive the word of God, is all throughout Acts. That's one of those themes. Acts 2.41 says, So then those who had received his word were baptized. Acts 11.1 1. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had receive the word of God. It's a term meaning people embrace the Christ of the scriptures. When they've received the word of God, they sent two apostles, Peter and John, verses 15 through 16, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The point is, it is something abnormal about this event, right? Did that, did that strike you as abnormal, what just happened? And yet, they had said that they believed and were baptized. This is unique. The only other place there's anything quite like this is in Acts 19 in Ephesus, where you have disciples who had only been baptized with John's baptism. Let's move on here for a second. We're going to come back to it, don't worry. Verse 17. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. It does not say that through the laying on of hands they received the Holy Spirit. There are two events here. They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Well, why is this here when the promise is in Acts 2 that you believe in Christ and receive the Holy Spirit? Right? Because in Romans chapter 8 verse 9, Paul says, If anyone doesn't have Christ, they do not have the Spirit. They are not His. They don't belong to Him. If you have Christ, you have a Spirit. What's going on here? Well, let's look at the Roman Catholicism view, right? The Roman Catholic view, or the High Episcopal view. It says this. This is the basis for what is called confirmation. Anybody ever heard of confirmation? Anybody know somebody who's ever been confirmed in the Roman Catholic Okay, well this is what their basis is. It's that time of year when the bishop comes and meets with children of certain ages and they come with their white outfits and I guess they say something. I gather they lay hands on them by the bishop and they're confirmed. This text will be used to say that's the basis of what according to the Roman Catholic Catechism is called a, a, a perpetuate, uh, I'm sorry, perpetuation can't read. Perpetuation of the grace of Pentecost. Now, I don't know if all these little children who are very sweetly all dressed up, nicely to be confirmed, know that, but that's what the church teaches. This is Pentecost being perpetuated to these children by a bishop by the laying on of hands. Now, what's interesting is that these were apostles here that did this, not bishops. What's also interesting is you usually don't have the laying on of hands in connection to the Holy Spirit. You don't find the apostles in this very same chapter going to Ethiopia, to the Ethiopian eunuch. But the Bible says he received the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, this is made a norm in Roman Catholicism. Interestingly, it's not only made a norm in Roman Catholicism... But because charismatic and Pentecostal theology 
is basically agreeing with Roman Catholicism here, we see it there as well. The gospel emphasizes the work of Christ for us. And what Pentecostalism or charismatic theology and Roman Catholicism put the focus on is what is in a person. Right? Tell me if you heard this. Pentecostalism, the charismatic movement, which actually grew out of Roman Catholic Church, essentially say the same thing in regards to what's called a second blessing. Anybody ever heard of that? The second blessing is you believe in Christ, then you may receive the Spirit when you receive Christ. But many, if not in most cases, there's another time when the Spirit comes on you and there's a laying on of hands of somebody. So the two are basically the same kind of views. But remember, this is a unique event. You don't read anything like this except maybe as we said in Ephesus, which is a different story entirely. They weren't baptized in the name of Christ in Ephesus. They received an old covenant baptism. You don't have this kind of separation from the spirit and the conversion of people. It's only given here. And notice it is apostles and notice for people who say that there's something lacking in you which is why you need a second blessing. Therefore you got to have it. There's nothing lacking here in the Samaritans. There's no lack in Philip. All it says is the apostles hear the Samaritans receiving the word of God and Peter and John are sent to them. They pray that they would receive the Spirit somewhat like what happened at the day of Pentecost and they laid hands on them and they received the Spirit. Some have, another view is, some have said perhaps plausibly, I, although I don't think it's the right view, the view is the Samaritans weren't saved yet. They received the word of God, they made a profession of faith, they were baptized, but they weren't saved yet. Then the apostles came, then the Spirit came, and then they were saved. But why do you need apostles to save people? So once again, you don't have any other illustration like that. This doesn't say, although we know this is going to come up, that the baptism was not equal to their hearts being changed. So no, we can't say the Samaritans weren't saved yet. So what do we say of this? You remember when we first encountered Acts. We talked that Acts is unique unlike any other book in the Bible because a lot of people like to take Acts as all prescriptive, and all descriptive. You know what I mean by that? For instance, you remember we looked in Acts 1 at the choosing of the apostles and we saw what the apostles did. What did they do? They gathered together. Remember what they got? They cast lots. And we said, that's descriptive of an event in church history, right? Because what happens when we do our deacon nominations? We don't gather together and say, well, let's go get some dice. And let's assign all the men in the church a number and we'll roll the dice and whoever gets that number is a deacon. No, that's prescriptive. That's descriptive, I'm sorry. And yet there are some things in Acts that are prescriptive, right? That teach us and show us that it's applicable to the day-by-day -day faith. Like the deacons in Acts chapter 6. How they're raised up out of needs, right? And we do that. When there's a need in the church for more deacons or a particular deacon, they're assigned to, to families in the church to help in that way. So remember this. This is where Acts is unique. Is not all of it is prescriptive. Not all of it is descriptive. Every other book in the Bible is either all or nothing. The New Testament letters are all prescriptive. This is what you are to do in the life of the local church. All the books of history, right? All the books of the story of David and Samuel, they're descriptive. They're telling us what happened on these certain historical events. And so here's what I want us to think about when we, when we come and we consider that there's this difference in prescriptive or descriptive. Number one, this right here in this section, it isn't a norm for everybody's Christian experience. You see, in the Bible, you have something that theologians call Historia Salutis, which is the history of salvation. So, for instance, God makes a covenant with Noah. It is an unrepeatable by that covenant that God preserves the world. That is not going to happen again. That's history. God makes a covenant with Moses after he leads his people through the Red Sea. That's unrepeatable. God makes a covenant with David. The king establishes a nation, event of history. Christ comes into history. 
He's the great king. He's the great God. He's the promised seed of Abraham. There's a cross. There's only one cross. Don't say, I've got my own personal cross. No, that's one historical event, the history of redemption. He goes to the grave. There's only one grave of Christ. Christ is raised from the dead. We're raised in him. We don't personalize all those things. But then there's ordo salutis, which is the order of salvation. And that we do. That's when we say, Christ died in history, but by his grace, my heart is changed now, and I rest in him. I receive and rest upon him alone as he's freely offered in the gospel. His righteousness is given to me. His atonement is given to me. I'm adopted in him. That's order salutis. That's how we're saved, the order of salvation. This, in this story, what do you think this is? This is the history of salvation. This is a once for all, unrepeatable event. What does that mean? And why? See if you can take a guess as to what's unique here and why this would be one unrepeatable event. We had one huge unrepeatable event already in our story in Acts chapter 2. Anybody want to know what that is? Pentecost. Do we have Pentecost every day? No. One historical unrepeatable event. And remember, the Spirit of God came to who? Acts 1.8. First, Jerusalem. What's happening here? The Spirit of God's now coming where? Samaria. And so it's interesting that you'd have another, not another Pentecost, but another stage of the gospel going forth to Judea and Samaria and the Spirit doing something unique here. What's interesting is there really is one other unique thing that the Spirit's going to do that we're going to get to in a couple weeks. And you know when that happens? Stage three. When the gospel goes to a man named Cornelius and in a dream reveals his will to go to all the Gentile nations. And so here's what I think we have here. A one singular event in history, in the history of redemption, where the gospel is now going to the Gentiles. And that may be like the world's worst place to stop, but that might be where we stop right now. Any questions about that? Yeah. I think, sure, I, I think absolutely. I think obviously we know that the only reason anybody believes is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in a person, right? And so I think the only reason we have to explain why these two things are separate, right? Why, why the Holy Spirit would, would cause or change some to believe and then indwell in them at a separate occasion is this singular event. I absolutely agree, yeah. But, but the, the thing that's interesting is that's, that, this is unique that this happens this way. Is that everywhere else the receiving of the Holy Spirit and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit happen simultaneously. Yeah. Do you think that it could also have something to do with the fact that they believed that Simon had great power to begin with and when Philip came they believed in Jesus? Sure. But that was also a I want to use a no. confirmation because sure. when the apostles came and they prayed sure. and they And it, it'd be interesting to perceive that that's the truth. But there'd be a couple things that we'd have to wrestle with there. Um, it would be order of baptism, which once again, um, this is what the, one of a text probably our Presbyterian brothers might like a little bit where it says that the order of baptism comes after they actually are converted. But I, I do understand the, the difficulty with that word believe because it says that Simon believed and we're going to find out Simon didn't actually believe, right? He didn't have true saving faith. He had an intellectual assent unto something. But what we don't find the apostles doing is when they're laying hands on everyone saying, well, this one now has really received the Spirit. This one hasn't. This one's Otherwise, right then and there, we'd have them saying, well, I may have laid my hands on Simon. And then we have a whole other doctrine, right? Because it doesn't say they didn't lay their hands on Simon. It says there's a, there's a dwelling of the Spirit that happens once at a time here. If they laid their hands on Simon and Simon received the Spirit, and then we hear that he's not actually a believer, 
We've got a whole other doctrine to, to deal with, the perseverance of the saints. And so I, I, I think there, there is, when it comes to Simon, and there is when it comes to those who very well may have believed in the same way Simon believed, but eventually follow through in faith. But I think when the, when the apostles come, Peter and John, and they lay hands on these people, and then the, the Spirit comes, I think the Spirit comes to those who believed by faith. And it's just a unique event. I told you this was interesting stuff, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and this, is, this is what I think laying on hands means, is we're going to get to this actually next week, is laying on hands is just showing a sign of unity, right? That's why we do that with deacons. When deacons come and we lay on hands, this is why the leaders of the church come and they lay hands to identify we are united in Christ together. It, it doesn't mean that by the laying of our hands, we've got some Benny Hinn powers where we have the spirit and we zap the spirit into somebody. That's not laying on hands at all. That's why these two events are separate. You've got the laying on of hands and then the receiving of the Spirit. Um, and so it's an identification thing. And that's when, when someone's praying and we come and lay hands on them for healing, we're identifying that they are not alone in this. That we come together as a church, that we're united in Christ together by faith, and we're symbolizing that by the laying on of hands. So that's really the importance of laying on of hands in the New Testament. It's like that every other place. But this is what's so difficult about the book of Acts is you take this one little snippet of this and you say there, there's, no, there's no clear distinction, even though there is, between laying on of hands and receiving the Holy Spirit. And it means that in every indication now, every time someone touches somebody and lays hands on them, the Spirit goes from them to them. And you, you, you find me one New Testament scripture that supports that. Uh, I don't think there is one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, and that's where you get, that's, that's where they take it, is they'd say, well, yeah, you know, Christ laid his hands on people, and what happened? They were healed, which is where you get your, your false theology of healing on, right? If somebody lays their hands on me, then I'm automatically going to be healed, because that's a secret power, and not... Not what it actually is. Identifying, Lord, we're, we're with this person. We're united them. Brother Justin? Yep. It's almost as if that's supposed to be descriptive for us and not prescriptive. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Jairus' daughter, right? Jairus comes to him and he's in panic. She's healed. Go back. Oh, cool. Great. That's, a, that's the message version of how that story goes. Um, any other thoughts or questions for tonight? All right, well, do me a favor. Keep reading Acts. Keep reading Acts 8. Join in together. We're going to continue and pick up on the rest of this as we come in next week. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, how it's just so relevant today. We don't have to change it. We don't have to modernize it. It just will always be relevant to life because it is sufficient for life. And we thank you for that. But we pray, um, Lord, that we be reminded that you're God overall. Lord, that we would learn uh, a, in a greater way how to interpret your text the way you desire for us to. And Lord, we'd be made more like Christ because of it. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.